This is video podcast 34 from learningradiology.com, Traumatic Injuries of the Foot, Part 1. I'm William Herring from Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. In this podcast, we're going to talk about fractures of the fifth metatarsal, stress fractures, fractures of the tarsal navicular, and calcaneal fractures. First, some normal anatomy. The tarsal bones consist of the first cuneiform, or the medial cuneiform, the second cuneiform. The third cuneiform is not well seen on this particular frontal view. It's also sometimes referred to as the lateral cuneiform. The tarsal navicular, here with the N on it, the cuboid, the talus, and the calcaneus. Also, before we leave the frontal view, we want to mention the small bones that are invariably present at the metatarsophalangeal joint of the great toe, which are sesamoids. These are well-corticated, usually oval or elliptically shaped bones that should not be mistaken for a fracture. They, again, are smooth and they're well-corticated. On the lateral view, we can see the talus that articulates with the tibia, the calcaneus, the tarsal navicular, the cuboid, the cuneiforms overlap each other, and of course the metatarsals and the phalanges. The junction between the hind foot, consisting of the talus and calcaneus, and the midfoot is called the Chopart joint, and the junction between the midfoot and the metatarsals is called the Lisfranc joint. Avulsion fractures of the fifth metatarsal are the most common fractures of the fifth metatarsal. They're usually due to inversion injuries, which lead to avulsion of the fifth metatarsal tuberosity. They're due to a pull of the perineus brevis tendon. The fracture is usually proximal to the metatarsal cuboid joint, and these kinds of fractures tend to heal quickly. This is an example of an avulsion fracture at the base of the fifth metatarsal. You can see that it's a fracture of the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal, and it's in line with the joint between the metatarsal and the cuboid. I wanted to make sure here that you don't mistake what is a normal apophysis found in the feet of growing children with a fracture. The normal apophysis at the base of the fifth metatarsal is oriented longitudinally, whereas fractures at the base of the fifth metatarsal are almost always oriented transversely. A true Jones fracture is a transverse fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal, which usually occurs about three quarters to an inch from the base of the fifth metatarsal. Jones fractures tend to heal more slowly than do avulsion fractures of the fifth metatarsal, and there is an increased risk of delayed or fibrous union with Jones fractures. This is an example of a true Jones fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal. You can see that the transverse fracture is about three quarters of an inch from the joint between the metatarsal and the cuboid bone. Stress fractures of the metatarsals are generally believed to be produced by repetitive microfractures. They tend to occur in individuals who have repetitive injuries, such as soldiers or dancers. The damage leads to first microcallus production and eventually gross callus production. There is buttressing of the bone as it remodels to accommodate for the stress, and that leads to endosteal thickening. In the foot, the second and third metatarsals are the most commonly fractured. Conventional radiographs are almost always obtained first, but they are relatively insensitive, especially early on in demonstrating stress fractures of the metatarsals. Within the first week, they can show only about 15% of all stress fractures. When they are positive, they demonstrate periosteal reaction and endosteal thickening. Technetium 99M bone scans are considered the gold standard. They are virtually 100% sensitive, and they are sensitive to stress fractures as soon as 72 hours after the injury.
Unfortunately, they're not as specific as they are sensitive, so that conventional radiographs need to be obtained in association with the bone scan. MRI is both extremely sensitive and very specific, but it is also expensive. This is an example of the periosteal reaction, which is classical for a stress fracture, in this case of the shaft of the third metatarsal. The fracture line itself is not visible, but the reaction to the fracture is. This is a more gross example of periosteal reaction surrounding a stress fracture of the shaft of the third metatarsal in another patient. And this is an example of a nuclear medicine bone scan, which shows in the right foot that there is an area of markedly increased tracer uptake along the shaft of the third metatarsal. This patient also had a negative x-ray to accompany this positive bone scan, and the two of them together, as well as the history, are diagnostic for a stress fracture. Fractures of the tarsal navicular usually are avulsions of the dorsal aspect. There may also be avulsions of the dorsal aspect of the calcaneus as well. These are secondary to twisting forces of the midfoot. They require a lateral projection on conventional radiography in order to be seen, and they tend to be treated conservatively. This is an avulsion fracture of the dorsal aspect of the tarsal navicular. You can sometimes see the same finding along the dorsal aspect of the calcaneus. Calcaneal injuries are the most commonly fractured tarsal bone. They're sustained usually in falls or jumps from a height. They can be classified as intraarticular, which comprises the vast majority, or extraarticular. It is important to evaluate involvement of the subtalar joint and the amount of depression of the posterior facet of the calcaneus, both of which usually require a CT scan. There are injuries that are associated with calcaneal fractures. There may be other fractures of the foot or ankle in up to a quarter of cases. You should always obtain a view of the thoracolumbar junction because there may be fractures of the thoracolumbar junction in up to 10% of patients. Calcaneal fractures are bilateral in up to 9% of patients, and in about 10% of patients, a compartment syndrome develops which can lead to soft tissue injuries or nerve injury. These are the landmarks on the superior aspect of the calcaneus, which enable us to measure Bowler's angle, which is an important angle in determining the degree of depression of the calcaneus. A line is drawn from the anterosuperior spine of the calcaneus to the posterior facet of the subtalar joint, which is the highest point of the calcaneus. A second line is drawn from the posterior facet of the subtalar joint to the posterior tuberosity of the calcaneus on which the Achilles tendon inserts. And then the angle between these two lines is measured. In normal people, it measures between 20 and 40 degrees. This patient has a fracture of the calcaneus, which is shown by the red arrow. And if we look at Bowler's angle in this patient, it becomes obvious that it is flattened and measures much less than 20 degrees. It measured about 8 degrees in this patient. Here's a patient who has a fracture of the calcaneus in which Bowler's angle is 0 degrees. The fracture of the calcaneus is a comminuted fracture. And as importantly, this lateral reconstruction from a CT of the thoracolumbar spine shows compression abnormalities of both L1 and L2 associated with the fracture of the calcaneus. Stress fractures of the calcaneus are uncommon. They frequently are sports related as in runners or in military individuals. They almost always are posterior and along the dorsal aspect of the calcaneus. X-rays will be normal at first and may take from two to four weeks before they show a classical sclerotic band in this location. 
a bone scan and an MRI, as with stress fractures of the metatarsals, will be positive earlier and is more sensitive. This is a classical example of a stress fracture of the calcaneus. The red arrow is pointing to a sclerotic band in the posterior and dorsal aspect of the calcaneus. In the next podcast, we'll discuss Lisfranc fracture dislocations and a Chopard fracture dislocations, and there'll be an extended mini quiz.